welcome to Story Power. We're your hosts. I'm Patrick McAndrew. And I'm Karen Fogg. We are podcasting from Oak Park, Illinois, which is in the western suburbs of Chicago. And we're here to talk about stories Stories that that changed changed our world. So today, actually, I just want to kind of remind everybody who we are. Uh, We are best friends and teachers uh, looking for something to do during the time of coronavirus. And here we are talking about stories of all kinds, whether it be film or books or personal tales and adventures. And today we are focusing on... Today we're going to focus on Ray Bradbury and especially... Um, a piece that he wrote a long time ago, but that uh, is a short story that became uh, very popu- popular in our classroom. Okay, wait, so just a little sidebar here. We are really working on getting rid of those those pesky ums that we found were in between our speech uh, the last time. So we are working on that. We've hit a couple already, but... Uh, Hopefully, by the end of this, we will have that under control. We're going to remind each other, right, Patrick? We are going to remind each other, but it happens kind of naturally, so we'll see if we can not make it happen. Yeah, and Ray Bradbury actually is a son of Illinois, and he's from Waukegan. He was born in Waukegan, Illinois, on August twenty second, 1920. So being that we are from Illinois, we thought we'd share uh, a writer who is a favorite son of Illinois and also some somebody that we actually use in our classroom quite frequently. Ray Bradbury is no longer with us. He passed away on June 5th, 2012, so eight years ago actually. It's 2020. He was, you know, what, 91 years old? 92, I think. 92 but, years yeah. old. Died after a lengthy illness. But he did spend his childhood in Waukegan, Illinois, where he was born and raised. His later years he spent in Los Angeles, California, where he passed away. But a lot of his stories um, take place in Waukegan, Illinois, which in some of his novels he refers to as Greentown, Illinois. Um, I can't they help really it. Come back they just, it, it, it. It's it, like it, a disease, guys. <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. So Ray Bradbury, we'll talk a little bit about him and some of his works, and then we're going to focus on one of his short stories all summer and a day. But I want to start by saying I um, loved Ray Bradbury growing up as a boy, and I read a lot of his stuff. And the piece that stands out for me in my life that um, I really enjoyed was um, the title is uh, something Wicked This Way Comes, which is a novel, takes place in Greentown, Illinois. It's considered to be part of a trilogy, which I just found out today, actually. I didn't know they were connected, but I guess they're connected because they all take place in Greentown. And that is uh, Dandelion Wine was the, the 1957 novel about this boy named Charles growing up in Waukegan, Illinois. In right, Greentown. which is really kind of a memoir. It's more, it's like a memoir of Ray Bradbury's life and there's, as well. And Ray Bradbury is known for being more of a sci-fi fantasy writer, but Dandelion Wine isn't that. Right. It really is just a reflection of this boy's childhood in the 1920s in Waukegan, which is... Uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes is about two friends also takes place in this in in this similar similar environment and a carnival comes to town run by mr dark mr dark's pandemonium carnival and the two boys are kind of drawn to this carnival and its magic and then just recently actually his last novel which he published in 2006 i want to say 2007 maybe was farewell summer yeah 2006 2006 and that that um, novel is a sequel to Dandelion Wine. But getting back to my favorite was always Something Wicked This Way Comes. Wait, and an interesting aside is that he was inspired by a carnival that he went to you know, as a child with uh, finding Mr. Electrico and meeting Mr. Electrico, who was a magician in a nearby carnival that he attended. Who touched him on the nose? Who and touched said, him and said, "You will live, live forever. forever." So he came back the next day and wanted to learn some tricks. And from that point on, it actually inspired him to write. And he said, from that moment on, from meeting Mr. Electrico, he wrote every single day 
in his life. So I think that was amazing. And I kind of think of that, I'm hoping that our kids will find some inspiration too as teachers that will make them want to write every single day, write something. Even, it doesn't have to be a big story. Sometimes it's just writing about what your observations are, um, just little small stories, small moments that can be turned into stories. Yeah, and that's, to me, it seems like that's what dandelion wine is, is these little vignettes about his childhood and things that he did one summer. Yeah. Um, getting back to uh, Ray Bradbury's and, and people's familiarity with him, a lot of his stuff was used in comics during this, the, the uh, 50s and 60s. A couple of his works were turned into Twilight Zone episodes, if you remember the TV show The Twilight Zone, hosted by Rod Serling. Right, me too. (laughs) So we're going to, that's actually going to be one of our later episodes we decided is talking about Twilight Zone. But they turned, for example, one of his short stories, I Sing the Body Electric, was turned into a Twilight Zone episode. I think it was called The Electric Grandmother, or it might have been, or it might have been vice versa. It might have been the, the short story was called The Electric Grandmother, yes. and it was turned into the Twilight Zone episode called I Sing the Body Electric, about three children who lose their grandmother, and or lose their mom, and then the father right. decides to get the kids an electric grandmother, a right. robotic, robotic grandmother, yeah. with, which they will never lose, which will be with them forever. And it's about loss and grief. And I think that's what one of the things I love about Ray Bradbury is that even though he writes fantasy and science fiction, he incorporates a lot of kind of universal themes. Sure, that everybody can kind of relate to in some way, shape, or form. So uh, this is something we've definitely used in our classroom and... I think, Patrick, you also had found um, another way to kind of make it come to life besides reading this fabulous short story, which it is. And something I love about short stories is I think they're really, really hard to write a really good short story. And um, so I'm a huge fan of anybody that can write a great short story. And Ray Bradbury is definitely one of them. Um, So I think that uh, it is something that to have something kind of contained where you've got this great beginning, middle, end, and it means something and it's impactful and all summer in a day has a lot of impact. And actually our kids have really responded to it. Patrick was able to locate a script version of it as well, which we've used in our classroom, which I think has also been invaluable because it really brings it alive in a different way for kids who like to learn in that way by performing and doing it as a reader's theater. So it's really, really, impo- I don't know, powerful. Yeah, and I've u- even used it where the kids have performed it as a play. I mm-hmm. present it to the students and then say, how do you think we could best use this script? And my students have said, can we perform it for the school? So when I was working and teaching in Nepal, my fifth grader said, can we do it in the theater? And they decided ways to light it and ways to use sound effects nice. to create the, the atmosphere of that piece. But just to give a little background about All Summer in a Day. So it's a short story. It was written in 1954. It is a sci-fi story, which uh, Ray Bradbury is known for. I mean, one of his most famous pieces. Oh, it's one of my favorites was there's Martian Chronicles, although I don't know if that, that's his, fa- his most famous. I think Fahrenheit, but I think, uh, Fahrenheit I think, 451. Oh, is, foreign, yeah, yeah, Fahrenheit 451, which if anyone knows about that, was also recently turned into an HBO movie um, with, um, I forget the guy's name that played the lead. Anyway, they re did the original because uh, it was made into a movie years ago, I think in the 70s. Uh, Fahrenheit 451 being the temperature at which a book burns. And it's all about kind of an allegory about what the future is going to look like on our planet. And, you know, book burning is just a natural part of everyday life. And it's about a librarian that kind of stands up against that. But um, getting back to All Summer in a Day. All Summer in a Day was written in 1954. It's a short story about a, a group of settlers living on the planet Venus in the future. And the story focuses on one main character. Margo. Margo. And Margo is different from the other kids on the planet because her family has recently um, moved to venus from earth right and she's missing and she's missing home she's missing earth which was her home whereas all the other kids were either born 
on the planet Venus or came there as small children and don't remember, have no memory of Earth at all. Right. So it creates this kind of rift between her and her classmates. They're all about the same age. And it's perfect for our students because they are about the age of our kids. I think it's even referenced that they, you know, the last time they've seen the sun because of the all summer in a day is about the atmosphere of Venus is constantly raining. It rains Cold. nonstop, which you kind of have to suspend disbelief because the planet Venus is not a, a planet that can be inhabited. It's, it's a gas planet. If you know anything about the solar system, Venus is not a planet we could live on. But in the story, they've been living there a long time. It rains constantly, and they can't really even go out in the rain because of the gravity and the force of the rain falling, but also because of the possible chemical composition of the rain, it could harm them. So they have to live out of the rain and they have created underground living dwellings. And, and artificial sunlight too, to kind of help them get that. To get the, so, the yeah, right. what they need from the sun. The story is focuses on Margot. She um, talks a lot about the sun with the other kids in her class. They write poetry, they do drawings about the sun. They're all super excited because it's been seven years, seven, seven years since the sun have, has come out. And scientists have said it's going to come out that day, the day that the short story takes place. And like you said, Karen, what I love about it is that it has very, it, when we're talking with students about the elements of literature and we talk about writing a short story, we talk about having a clear beginning, a clear middle, where there's usually some sort of climax, and then a very clear end. And in four pages of text, Ray Bradbury is able to do that. He's able to introduce the setting, introduce the characters, introduce the conflict. He's able to build up the tension and it climaxes and then he's able to bring it to a a, a quick actually resolution and end right. which to many people is um if you haven't read it you know, some people find the ending unsatisfactory as a matter of fact some of our kids often say that's it that's where it ends but and i they... love it i love it because it does lead itself to conversation about well what should happen next what would happen how would this what could happen you know whether it be and we'll tell a little spoiler alert we're going to tell you how it ends right we're um, going to we'll tell the ending of the so, story why don't you tell what happens in the right in the, in so, the plot so as they're leading up Margot and the kids are very excited about the possibility of seeing the sun and they've been te the teacher has been teaching them about sunlight and all it's you know what it's made of and Margot has been sharing what she's looking forward to and she's talking in a more personal way about what the sun means to her and she's painting uh, pictures of it and doing poetry as well and we have um, some clips the the story was turned into in the 1980s there was a TV series called Wonderworks and Wonderworks would present these short half hour 40 minute films versions of classic literature or children's literature and all summer in a day was turned into a a short film and we have three audio clips to play for you right now which you can kind of you'll meet some of the characters the teacher william who's kind of the antagonist of the story and margo so we're going to play those for you right now william william it's your turn what we were talking about the sun Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the sun is made of two gases. One is hydrogen. Never mind. Margo. Hey, I'm not done. William, you know you're supposed to contribute something new about the sun and not repeat what has already been said. Now, please pay attention. Margo. The sun is like a flower that blooms for just one hour and fills our worlds with light and leaves us feeling bright. Oh, that's lovely, Margo. Did you write it? Yeah, it's a poem. It's just lovely. Oh, doesn't look like it's going to stop. Matter of fact, it looks to me like it's coming down even harder. Right, Michael? Oh, yes. Precisely 1.5 times harder than it was an hour ago. But we still have almost two hours. Yeah. 
Well, I say it's not going to stop. I say the sun's not going to come out at all. William, why do you hate me so much? Why? Because you're such a know-it-all. Oh, you may have Mrs. Callahan fooled, but you don't have me fooled for one second. You've never seen the sun. You've never, ever seen it. Still think it's going to stop? Marco, why are you hiding that? It's beautiful. I don't know. It's not exactly the way I wanted it to be. Mrs. Cal Class, I want you all to look at this. Margo, tell everyone about your painting. Well, I tried to make it how it looked when I lived on Earth in Ohio. There was sun all the time. I can still see it, but I just can't paint it right. How lucky you are to have lived on Earth long enough to remember the sun so vividly. Now we have to keep our fingers crossed for the rain to stop and for our sun to shine on our planet so that we have lovely memories too. All right, so you get a sense of what happens in the story. And unfortunately, how it ends is that... Uh, the kids are separated from the teacher. She's exited the space uh, for a time. The kids are left alone. And Margot and William, there's kind of a confrontation. And he basically is called, basically calls her a know-it-all. And he's tired of hearing about it. And he puts, he and the other, along with the other kids, they place her in a closet or in a room that they lock and don't let her out. And when the teacher comes back, there's excitement because all of a sudden they realize because and all in this whole time too they don't believe that it's going to happen they think it's not they're not going to see the sun that she's lying it's not everything that she says it's going to be and when the teacher comes back the rain starts to stop they're allowed to go out for the two hours and play and it's not until they return that they say oh my gosh, what about Margot? That they've forgotten that they placed her locked up. And the ending of the story is them releasing her from the locked room. And that's it. I mean, it literally ends with them not being able, it, the, the, the text even says something along the lines of, without being able to glance at each other, they unlock the door and let Margot out. And right. As a matter of fact, I'm going to quote from it because it says, they walked slowly down the hall in the sound of cold rain. They turned through the doorway to the room in the sound of the storm and thunder, lightning on their faces, blue and terrible. They walked over to the closet door slowly and stood by it. Behind the closet door... Oh, I just lost it. It was silence. Sorry. They walked over to the closet door slowly and stood by it. Behind the closet door was only silence. They unlocked the door even more slowly and let Margo out. And that's how it ends. I mean, it just comes to an end. And that's what I, I kind of like that because, and then I do agree that I think it kind of sparks conversation from the kids when they start saying, is that it? Well, what, yeah. what happens then? And then it's a great discussion started to say well what do you think happens right. next how don't do you, you love those oh, and, or, or, or yeah or saying right yeah. what do you think the kids were feeling yeah and how do you know that and how, how do you know that based on his text what they were feeling and a lot of the kids will say oh they were probably feeling you know embarrassed or guilty or remorseful that they had done this yeah. You know. And then how was she feeling? How could she recover from that? Because throughout it, you know that um, you kind of learn a little bit about Margot, too, that she's really not adjusting to life on Venus. And her parents are even considering you know, moving back, even though it would uh, be a huge change for them financially. So there's a lot of pressure on a little girl. So I think lots of kids can kind of relate to those things, too, when decisions are made about them, for them, uh, by their parents. Sometimes those decisions they feel aren't the right ones, and sometimes they do. I mean, we're all we're all in the we're all in that boat in some way um, during our lifetime. So it's also about decision making as well. Sometimes you have to weigh things, weigh factors in there. Yeah, and I like the the the. It's interesting because we we then often watch the 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 video, the DVD, the movie version of yeah. the short story. And we spend some time comparing and contrasting the two pieces and what they've added 
to the filmed version right. is very interesting and kids notice it right away. They'll notice some of the elements. Well, why did they add, you know, we it's just reference that they have these things in the in the story, but in the movie they have to show like the kids going under the sun lamps. Um, and there's some interesting elements that they like there's a scene where the kids are outside playing in the rain right. which in the short story doesn't really make sense because we want to believe that they can't go out in the rain that right. they're really kind of trapped in these dwellings they have to remain underground because for their own it's safety unsafe, right. whereas the film opens with them playing kick the can in a yeah. in the rainstorm so there it's fun to kind of have the kids uh, you know notice the differences but the big difference that I find in the film compared to the text is the final moment of the film the children after they've let her out of the closet you know gather around her and hand her the flowers that they've collected out in the sun and William is kind of standing isolated from the rest of the group. She's Margot's clearly upset. I mean, she even has tears in her eyes as she goes outside and she kind of looks that it's raining again, kind of looks kind of forlornly at the environment, which is gray and, you know, cloudy and lightning. And William approaches from behind and he hands her a flower, which she turns to him and says, I think she even says something like, it is the way I said it was, wasn't it? And he kind of nods and she accepts the flower from him. And then the two of them kind of lean together into each other, which totally changes the ending for me because it does show that the kids were, you know, wanted to be forgiven by her, that they accepted w that what they did was wrong. And William kind of has this sense of, you know, grief and remorse. remorse. Yeah. And that I think is different by putting that into the story. It kind of takes that element away from our students in being able to say, well, what do you think they're feeling? Right. What do you think they will do next? How will they recover from this as a class, right. that they've done this horribly mean act to this girl. Yeah, that, that they can't ever rectify. Right, they can't erase they can't, it. Right. They can't make it better. No. And I'm sorry, even giving her flowers that they were able to well, enjoy. Can I even tell you that that actually bugged me too? Because in the story, there's nothing that says that there was a s flowers everywhere. They just were playing in the warmth right. of the sun. It doesn't say that everything in this one, it's like everything's instantly grown like it's been long, you know, old growth. It looked like prairies and fields that they're running through. I don't know. It, that that sort of bothered me, too, just the interpretation of it as well. Right. So, Whereas in the text, it just talks about how things were rinsed. Yeah. That the. the, the there was no color. The, right. And that. No all, right. That that's what changed yeah. is that with the sun coming out, they were able to see the color of their skin and the color of their eyes and the color of their clothes. But you're right, it doesn't talk about the environment. It just talks about them running, right. playing, laughing, mm -hmm. somersaulting, yeah. you know, g kinds of kid things, but not running through grass. Or I mean, they're on Venus. And so. it would still be, it would be muddy or messy anyway. It wouldn't instantly in two hours be dried up. Right. So, and even if it did, it would probably take that length of time to dry it up, even with some super fast sun. I don't know. Anyway, that sort of bothered me too. But it was always interesting because I think the kids always say they prefer the written story to the film. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And then one other element I really like about All Summer in a Day and using it for, we actually use this piece at the beginning of the year to introduce, to introduce the elements of literature to kids that we'll be talking about throughout the entire fifth grade year, you know, referencing things like theme and plot and conflict and resolution and protagonist and ag antagonist, all these literary words. But we also look at when we talk about theme, one of the things we ask the kids is, well, what do you think the theme of this story is? And because there's so much wrapped up in it, mm -hmm. you hear so many different responses right. from different kids, and it gives us a really good idea of how they think. Sure. And one of the themes that almost always comes up is that idea of how we treat people who are different than us. Right. Because Margot is clearly she stands out as being different from them in in the fact that she's lived on earth she remembers the sun and they can't accept that the the all the kids in the class kind of ostracize her 
because she's different. And we talk about, well, do we do that to people? Do we do that to new students? Do we do that to people who are different religions or different races or different genders, who are in a wheelchair or who have some sort of, who are differently abled in some way? How do we embrace them into our classroom community? Right. Or do we, in some ways, do these subtle things that make them feel they don't belong. Right. And although most of the kids, of course, are horrified by hearing how she's treated and say that they can't relate to that in any way, but they do know it exists. So I think that many of them often will say, I just can't believe why would they do this to her just because she was not liking where she was living and she was sharing what she loved about home and what she missed and what she was looking forward to seeing with with the coming of the sun. So a lot of them can't wrap their brains around that. And yet when we do talk about it, they are aware that, oh, yeah, we know it does happen. And, uh, you know, so I think it's really it is important and it's a great thing. Part of it was in the. Oh, in the voice you're hearing. Nathaniel this is, Walker. Our, this is our, our, our guest our guest friend, Nathaniel Walker. Who's, who's decided to participate, which I'm so grateful. Go, go ahead. I think part of it was envy, because I remember when I was a kid, that's what kids would tell each other. But I guess since it's written in that era, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. But they would, we would call each other know-it-alls, mm -hmm. because her experience was what they wanted. So they were envious of that. Right. So they just bullied her, basically, because yeah. of it. And I think you're right. I think jealousy can definitely, it's such a, it's such an all-consuming, terrible emotion, really, because it doesn't do any good. You kind of have to get, if you're feeling those kind of inklings of jealousy or envy, you've got to, okay, figure out, well, what is it that I need for yeah, myself? And for her, it yeah. must have been so, like, there's nothing she can do about it. That's yeah. her life. It's her truth. She can't change it. Yeah, and it's yeah, funny because she is trying to, she's doing her best to show them, but it is like this, and you're going to love it, and she's trying to be friendly, yeah. but it ends up just ostracizing her even more because it's her, her experience becomes almost her downfall with these kids well, because... And, and I think that sometimes that can happen with somebody who's, she was so unhappy. There was no happiness in her, so the other kids were just thinking that, Oh my God! You're just she's. They're seeing the miserableness of Margot, and she's hating a home that's been only there. It's been their home. So if somebody's only bashing your home and that's all they're doing, then it's also kind of hard, you know, being kids too. How do they kind of separate that and say, okay, she's not really bashing us. You know, instead, some of them might have even looked at, oh, my God, you know, there's just she's just always negative and she just wants to go back to Earth. Well, why doesn't she just go back to Earth? Mm -hmm. You know, um, kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, we even see that in our own country with people talking about when when immigrants come and are part of the, the fabric of our nation and start to speak about problems that our nation is having. Often people will say, well, why don't you go back instead of. No, we all want to be here to build something better, to make it stronger. I've had experiences like that in the fourth grade. When really? When we moved to Texas from Louisiana, and I was, like, miserable. And I was told, go back to Louisiana. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I feel like that's a pretty natural fallback mm -hmm. for people. I they, think you're right. They feel affronted when you talk about their home in a negative way. Yeah, they take it personally. Mm -hmm. Instead of, yeah, we should all be looking at our place and how can we make it better? So, yeah. But and it is interesting that in the television version, they kind of give her a friend. There's one character in the story that kind of accepts her and becomes her buddy. And there's even a scene where the two of them are looking at, her, at Margot's memory box and she's got like butterflies and things that she brought from Earth and she's explaining it to a friend. But I, I also think that that changes the dynamic of the sure. story sure. by yes. having one of the kids be kind of an ally. Which she doesn't really have in the, in the short story. Not she, much of one. I mean, there's some kids that are just less overt about they come but some of them are you know they're basically bystanders they go along with with William and you know his what he what he's doing 
nobody really speaks out. Yeah, and even the teacher doesn't, the, the teacher is just kind of this, it's interesting because... <laughs> she's not even there. <laughs> she's kind of a force that, yeah, is just not present, which is interesting because then it becomes this in this this community and this environment that's all, it's all kids. Very Lord of the Flies. Right, there's no, exactly, yeah. very Lord of the Flies. There's no adult that's kind of guiding them and saying, this is incorrect, and you're right. Even when the event happens, the teacher's, kind of this non-entity in checking to see if all of her students are there right. or, you know, she, she doesn't even do any of that. And it's even more apparent in the... Yeah, she asks them, is everybody here? And they all go, yes. And then and they... Out they yeah. And out they go, yeah. yeah. And I'm sorry, she doesn't have that many kids in the class. She could count heads easily. There's less than 10. Yeah. <laughs> so head count, very easy to do. Yeah. So unlike uh, unlike Ray Bradbury, who has um, great endings, <laughs> we're still working on how to end ours, but we're going to end this episode right now uh, with how to. And we hope that this might inspire some teachers to utilize maybe this story or some others in your classroom and find scripts to go along with it or maybe even a, a movie and bring that in to talk about the elements of literature. You can feel free to reach out to Karen and I if you know us from our uh whether we post it, whether you hear this on YouTube or you hear it on Facebook, please contact us um, at our school and right because I'm not on Facebook, sorry. But I am, and you can <laughs> and you can just con- and we'll, we'll be happy that. to give you any resources we have to help you out. We do have the DVD; it is available on YouTube. If you want to, yeah. the whole short film, it's 28 minutes long, is on YouTube. You can find the text to the piece online and use it in your classroom. It's really appropriate and really great literature. So we have two people we'd like to thank today. We'd like to thank our friend Nathaniel Walker, who's going to help us. Thanks, Nathaniel. Yeah, Nathaniel came in from Pennsylvania, and he's visiting Chicago, and we just want to, he's going to help us with some editing on this episode. And then we'd also like to... Oh, we'd we'd love to thank Jeremy Kahn, our friend, and actually he's a former by parent and when i say by it's b-e-y-e because we're at william by elementary school in oak park um he was a former by parent we had his boys in our class they are now no longer boys they're men and he was um gracious enough to create our opening and closing uh, theme music so thank you jeremy khan thank you jeremy he's an amazing musician and uh, an all-around great guy so we thank him for that And we hope to uh, see you all next time. And until then, keep listening to stories and enjoying them. Yeah.